and I deal with the emotional part of what's going on, and that's standard practice, and that's the way it should be. So it isn't one or the other, it's both. It isn't one or the other. No. It always works. Yeah, always works. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. How, okay, this is about, all about, well, there's an interesting question here. I have, have you heard of cranial sac sacrotherapy? Mm -hmm. Rhinos, yeah. Yes. Uh, can it help in treating depression? When you do self-hypnosis, is there a danger that you won't be able to bring back oneself? That you won't be able to come back? Come back, yeah. come back. Okay, well, craniosacral therapy is a kind of manipulation therapy that uh, I've mostly heard used about for pain and headaches and things like that. I don't know that much about it, but I think it can be helpful as a physical manipulation, largely for physical kinds of pain disorders. Um, I have never lost a patient in hypnosis. I, I can count on the fingers of this hand the number of times in my career when somebody has appeared to be sort of stuck in a trance, and I've always been able to get them out. So all hypnosis is really self-hypnosis, and the worst thing that would happen is you fall asleep, and then when you wake up, you're sort of back where you were. So no, there's no danger of getting lost in a trance. Okay. Uh, <laughs> This is, uh, again, about depression. You said, doctor, that we have to watch the patient more when it seems to have come out of the depression. Why? Yes. Why? The, the, re the reason you have to watch them more is that, first of all, depression is a relapsing and remitting illness. So people get undepressed, they get depressed again. But in particular, as they're coming out of the depression, they don't just you know, get better like that. What happens is they've still got a lot of those feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, and worthlessness. But as they're coming out, they've got more energy. And so they can then enact plans that they may have made while they're depressed. And they're not well enough that they say, God, why was I thinking that I'm such a terrible person? I'm really not. They still sort of feel that way. But they can think, you know what, I'd feel even better if I took a gun and shot myself or if I overdosed. And so it's a dangerous time because they're partially, you know, it, the way to think of it is a little bit like if you're recovering from a broken leg after a couple of weeks, you may feel, oh, the pain is gone and the thing's pretty much healed. You don't go out and run, you know, because the leg is still vulnerable, but you may think it's okay to do it because it doesn't hurt anymore. So in the same way, you've got to be sure that you're really healed before you decide it's over. Okay, what would be the first best thing to do every time you feel you are, you are insulted, you, every time you are insulted and you feel hopeless and worthless until you develop depression? I think when you're insulted a, and you feel hopeless. I think, yeah, it's like uh, whenever you're insulted, you feel hopeless and yeah. worthless, and uh. so you might get into a depression. Yeah, well, that can happen. Well, I would say, you know, we have different ways of putting, giving our thoughts perspective. And you know, one way uh, is to just sit down when you're not interacting with anybody and think about it and think, Did I, is the way I took it initially really the way it is? Or maybe I overreacted. Maybe it seemed like more of an insult than it was. Um, to try and see it from different points of view. Sometimes it helps to talk it over with someone else, to say, well, here's the way it seemed to me. What does it seem like to you? Or, you know what, to clarify it with the person. You know, one useful thing when you're having a difficult conversation is to say to the person who says it to you, here's what I think I heard you say, is that what you meant? So restate it and check it out. And it may be that's right. They may say, yep, that's what I meant. Or they may say, no, that really isn't what I meant. So it's better to get clarification and reflect on it with, with other people. You asked earlier how, be, how being around depressed people makes us feel. Mm -hmm. When I was severely depressed, one close friend of mine avoided me in subtle ways, which she confessed to me in a letter several years later. She said I tend to drain her energy and maybe she, she feared my negativity would influence her to be negative too. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this? about avoiding negative people because one can also be influenced to be negative and that can, it can drain your energy. Yeah. Well, I think I mentioned before that it, you know, depressed people can be hard to be around. You know, they can make you feel angry or drained. They tend not to give back. They don't respond in a normal way interpersonally. 
And it sounds like this woman's friend has some regret for having withdrawn. Obviously, you have to protect yourself, and you can help only so much. And if you really feel that you're being sucked in, sucked in with the person, then you have to take steps to protect yourself. But it may also be that you can use that. You can say to your friend, I know you're feeling terrible. Uh, I'm starting to feel maybe the way you feel. And is there something we can do to help each other out of it? to sort of make it an empathic experience rather than a kind of threat that they're going to pull you down. And that might be another way to do it. Okay. There was a lady who asked the question about the hyp hypnosis uh, experience. Yeah. You addressed the concern and clarification of the lady earlier that she might be kinesthetic and not visual. Mm -hmm. Does learning style or determining learning styles of a person a vital information in facilitating hypnosis? Well, it's, it's useful to know that as people do have different ways of learning and some are more auditory and some are visual and some are kinesthetic, um, but hypnotizability doesn't seem, for example, to be related to imagery ability or anything like that. So I'd say the simplest thing is to just do it, try it, see what happens. And uh, you'll learn the extent to which you get benefit from it. Uh, oh, this is a different one. Would you say that the presence of toxics, this is a new research area, I think, would you say that the presence of toxic substances like heavy metals in the body or hair is an important factor or a cause of depression? I know of a doctor in alternative medicine who says that toxic substances in the body may cause depression. And she sometimes prescribes chelation to remedy the situation. Please comment. I think that's a common well, question. Well, yeah, I, I have patients who, who get tested for things like that. Um, on the one hand, you know, it is probably true that we have so industrialized the world and so polluted the air and the water that there are a lot of toxic substances. You know, you can eat enough tuna and get a job as a thermometer. You know, there's, uh, there's so much mercury in, in, in the ocean now. And I do worry about that. But on the other hand, I have not seen evidence that directly links toxic exposure or heavy metal levels to depression. And I'm not, I don't, have also not seen studies that demonstrate that chelation or other ways of trying to cleanse the body of these toxics is a treatment for depression. So I'd say in general, I think we do have reason to wor worry <coughs> about some of the industrial residue that's in the food chain and in the environment. And on the other hand, I'm not convinced that, that um, I'm not convinced that it has a direct effect on depression, on I don't view chelation as a treatment for depression. Maybe to follow up uh, on my own reading, maybe the minds of people here, how about uh, on disorders like spec uh, autism spectrum disorder and yeah. uh, ADHD? I well, there is concern with that and also chronic fatigue syndrome is another one, chronic fatigue syndrome, as well as there, there, there are some beliefs that autism may be due or ADHD in part to toxics in the environment when children or infants are very young. And I think it's an interesting question that's worth pursuing. I don't think we have any definitive answers for that yet, but it's worth pursuing. It's not to the point where, you know, major environmental change can be justified. It's also not to the point where there's a specific treatment for ADHD based on that. Okay. Uh, I think this might be uh, in the minds of most people. Talk, talk, when they raise their hand about menopause and aging, okay, is it normal for for 80-year-old person not to have a good eight hours sleep? What is sleeping disorder? How many hours sleep does one need to be healthy, especially for the elderly? Well, it's a good question. As we age, we tend not to sleep as long and as deeply as we did when we were 20. You know, when you're 20, you're out. You know, you're just out and nothing wakes you. And as you get older, you tend not to sleep as deeply. But I would say eight hours is a good number. We tend not to give ourselves enough sleep. Electric lights make it too easy to just stay up and do things when really our ancestors just went to sleep when it got dark. So most of us are sleep deprived. And I would say a good thing to plan for is eight hours a night of actual sleep. One of the things that is not so well recognized that, that keeps some people from sleeping is what's called sleep apnea syndrome. There are people, if people snore loudly, if you wake up 
feeling like you can't breathe, uh, if you wake up with a headache in the morning, not feeling rested, it may be that you have an illness where your soft palate actually blocks your trachea when you get deeply asleep and then you start to choke and you have to keep waking. So you have hundreds of awakenings every night and there are procedures that can be done to treat that. So some people who aren't sleeping have a specific and treatable reason for it. But in general, I just think we go to bed too late, uh, we're overstimulated, and we don't let ourselves get the sleep we should get. Another tip is if you're sleepy during the day, if you sort of uh, find yourself falling asleep listening to interesting lectures like mine, the odds are, <laughs> the odds are that you're sleep deprived and you ought to get some more sleep. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask that, that uh, you get sleepy during the day. Yeah. Because, and you didn't know that you had a, uh, you didn't sleep well that night. Yes. And so you're driving thing. and, you know, something. something That's very sleep. dangerous. You know, one of the biggest problems with young people driving is that even young people are the least experienced drivers. There's always a worry about substance abuse. And they're among the most sleep deprived because teenagers need more sleep than young kids. They need like nine or ten hours. Do they get it? No way, you know, because they want to stay up late and then they have to get up early for school. Right. So they're very sleep right. deprived. And a lot of the drunk driving or other accidents that teenagers have in cars really has to do with sleep deprivation. Yeah, I think so. Okay, I am a counseling psychologist. I'm starting to see a 14-year-old boy diagnosed with psychotic depression. He has been a victim of bullying for several years. How can we best help depressed children who are victims of peer harassment? Are there gender differences in the way children react to bullying? Uh, well, that's a complex problem. I mean, certainly uh, the child needs the benefit of good treatment, both medication and um, psychotherapy. And someone who is psychotically depressed has what are called mood congruent delusions. So, you know, if you're just depressed, you think, I'm a terrible person. If you're psychotically depressed, you think, my insides are rotting, I'm the worst human being on the face of the planet, I've caused terrible things with other people that aren't true. So they're vulnerable, they can't defend themselves. And unfortunately, some children can be very cruel with someone who just can't defend themselves, who, who rather than saying, go to hell, get away from me, will say, yeah, you're right, I'm terrible. They will pick on people who are different. That I see as more of a school, community, and social problem. Basically, if the child really is that vulnerable and can't defend themselves from bullying, you may have to put them in a different environment where they're more protected. Or you go to the school principal and say, look, this isn't right. This child is ill. He needs protection. He's not getting it. And sometimes the school systems are just too hands off and they just don't pay enough attention to those kinds of things and they should. Yes. I, I, I read that because it's a very common uh, concern now, the bullying in schools. As a matter yeah. of fact, if I may put my two cents worth, there are now schools that are trying to do a comprehensive program looking at the system of bullying, which is the bully, the bullet, and the bystander. Right. And I think it's the whole system that has to be worked in. It's a system, yeah. And uh, I mean, the bullies are disturbed and sometimes just cruel people, but they're, you know, it's a social communication, and it is also when other people stand around and watch it. Now, some of it is they're afraid that they're going to be the next target, but there are always more bystanders than there are bullies. So there are ways of dealing with it. And that's where I think school administrators need to take more vigorous action to set in place things that will make sure that that gets stopped. Because it's very bad socialization for children. If that's allowed to go on, you're giving kids a terrible message about what it will be when they grow up. People should not treat one another that way. OK. One general question of maybe, from your experience, will music therapy help in reducing depression? Uh, I'm not an expert on uh, music therapy. I like music, uh, even answer. though I can't sing, Ricky. Uh, <laughs> you insulted his voice. But um, I think there is some evidence that mood and cognition can be improved by listening to certain kinds of music. and. Uh, uh, I think it could be helpful as an adjunct in depression. I think it's one, you know, if you can, if you can find music that a given person feels actually does make them feel better, and sometimes they'll start out uh, actually wanting to hear rather dark, discordant music that you'd say is depressing, but to them is a kind of at least being in touch with someone who also has a kind of dark side. And then gradually you can kind of 
make the music a little more upbeat as their depression improves.